The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the line, this is your song. All right, welcome everybody to another uh, two-way media workshop. I'll try to do these as often as possible. Uh, did them on a regular basis on Tuesdays and Saturdays for a long time. And now I'm trying to do them as often as possible to uh, create a place for people that are creating two-way media to come together and ask questions, share resources, and uh, collaborate so we can work together stronger in uh, 2020. So a couple of things we'll start off with here is we've got the Gun Rights Policy Conference coming up in September of this year, on September 21st and through the 22nd. So that's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the second, well, it's the third Saturday, and it's the third weekend in, in September this year. It's less than 90 days away. The uh, conference is, uh, let's see, does it say this is the 34th annual, so they've been doing this for 34 years. And it gets the gun owners' rights groups from all different levels, states, areas, areas of interest or focus. They all come together. Um, most of them take the stage. They talk about what they've been doing, what they're looking forward to, what they need. And uh, it's an opportunity to support them by being in the room with them. It's an opportunity to meet the, the people that found it and the people that support and run these organizations. And... Uh, it's this year in September, so uh, we want to let people know about that. It's free to jo to jo attend. Uh, just uh, follow the or just register here so that they can get your uh, stuff that you're going to get and your uh, lunch ready. Uh, you get fed and you get a lot of materials. So if you're just looking at it as a transaction. It's the best transaction you'll get for pro guns because it costs nothing, and you'll get a lot out of it as far as getting fed well getting contacts and meeting people, you'll get materials and you'll get knowledge and you get a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment because most of the people that you'll meet, everybody that you meet actually is just regular people that were no longer satisfied with the way things were and understood that it just takes individuals effort to make things change. And once you've got that knowledge, then you do things like this, run chats by yourself for no money. To let people know that it is possible to uh, to affect change, and it might not affect change every Saturday with fireworks and and whistles, but when you are deliberately putting down information that's valid to combat the anti's agenda-based misunderstanding, you know, misleading uh, information, there's a uh, value to that. Same as brushing your teeth or mowing the lawn, you just don't see it. You know, as a as an adult, you don't see it. You don't need the uh, to see the results immediately. So that's the Gun Rights Policy Conference. And again, I don't think you can support any of these organizations um, since all the organizations will be there. The only, there's two organizations that won't be there. One big one with the three letters and the other one is mm, 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 four letters. Uh, otherwise, every other organization is there. And uh, if you want to support those organizations, again, the people that founded them, the people that run them, and the people that are them, you know, the, the people that create, you know, that are these organizations, they'll be there and a full room on both Saturday and Sunday. I can't imagine a better way to support them, uh, to show them that their efforts are worthwhile and they're reaching people. Um, I don't know, I have some experience with nobody showing up to your efforts, and uh, I can imagine it would be even more um, useful to have people get up off their butt and get to Phoenix. It's no small task, except for people like me who can just drive down the road. Uh, aside from that, it's... Um, it's a great opportunity to meet people, and if you're creating content, that's what these two way media workshops are for. People that are creating content or considering creating content, uh, I want to encourage you to do so. There's probably no financial gain at all, other than the satisfaction. I think, like Sean from We Like Shooting said in our chat the other uh, a month ago now, uh, if it's all done and said and we lost, would you rather be one that fought or one that just said, "Yeah, we probably won't win," just sat there and didn't do anything? I'd always rather be one that fights because I've seen too many times when they said there's no way to win and the people that put in effort change that. So if you're in one of those most people and you want to uh, go to this event to meet these, to, to meet the organizations, people that make the organizations up, then I'm going to encourage you to also can, uh, um, consider the AMCON. I guess it stands for Second Amendment 
media workshop. And then that comes into AMCON. And then uh, that's the day before the Gun Rights Policy Conference. So if you uh, go to their main page and click on register, you can register for this event. It's also free. I think they just need to know how many people to set up chairs for, and maybe there's going to be, I'm not sure what they're going to do. So you can register, though, and uh, and be an, a member of that event. And that'll be, I'll just close it, that'll be the day before gun rights policy. So that'll be on Saturday, September, or Friday, September 20th at the same location. So if you just go to the gun rights policy conference, uh, or if you go to the AMCON first, they both fit together. Uh, in either case, in the evening on September 20th, everybody will get together. It's sort of a meet and greet. Uh, there's usually like coffee and drinks and uh, some little foods, you know, things to eat, a little piece of cheese or cake or something. And then uh, on the 21st, everybody gathers in the morning uh, for the conference. You can see from the pictures, it's usually a conference room in a hotel, in this case, a big hotel in Phoenix. And we've got a, a conference room there. There'll be a the area out front of the conference room will have a bunch of tables set up and most of a bunch of the Second Amendment uh, and gun owners rights groups will be represented there and you can chat with them uh, individually you know speak to them about whatever you might want to do or offer resource or something and then uh, purchase their uh, logo stuff so it's a great way to get their patches and their shirts and stuff without wasting money on shipping because uh, they'll have a bunch of that stuff there and there's not a lot of people that attend, so there's almost always extra stuff. You never have to worry about running out. Uh, so that'll be Saturday. It'll start early. Uh, it'll run through lunch with conferences, with uh, sessions. And then at lunchtime, everybody gets fed. And you stay in the conference and just keep going with your food. It's usually pretty decent food. In fact, it's always been pretty decent food since I've been aware of it. Uh, then we get to the afternoon conferences, and then it'll end again. There'll be a bit of a pause, and then they'll have an evening, I guess, is our dinner. And uh, you get fed again, and uh, lots of opportunity to chat and to, uh, again, network and collaborate on projects. So uh, if you're attending the AMCON uh, or you are creating content, you're just attending the Gun Rights Policy Conference, the conference itself is great for information and for getting to know everybody, but the after hours are just as uh, effective. Unlike SHOT Show or some of the other big events, there's, I don't believe there's a whole bunch of things to do. There's really just the one meet and greet and the one get together. So it's not like you have to have your attentions divided or anything. Uh, and then uh, it's real casual. Everybody gets to hang out and you get to see everybody with their hair down. And it's a very effective uh, time on both Friday and Saturday. Sunday, it'll start up again and it's a shorter day. And they'll again have a lot of the focus groups on Sundays, uh, some more of the gun owners rights groups will chat, uh, and then they'll wrap it up. It's also an opportunity to uh, have um, to read any, what are they called, like, at, uh, motions. So as a member of the gun rights policy conference, I guess you can, or maybe probably a member of uh, Citizens Committee Keeping Bear Arms, I think that's who puts it on. Uh, but as a member, you can propose a resolution, uh, for example, getting rid of the NFA or opposing bump stocks, you know, whatever it might be. And when they're resolved, then I guess the the, the uh, pro gun owners rights movement would be like, I don't know, I don't want to say officially aware, but you know, they, they can put it on the list of things to address. And uh, so there's some interactivity on Sunday, I guess. I'm not uh, I'm butchering all that, but uh, go on Sunday and figure it out for yourself or go on Saturday and ask about what's going to happen Sunday so you're not caught off guard. But uh, there's definitely an opportunity on Sunday to be, interact with the conference and to have your position known if, if the, the community is missing something or not paying attention to something on the horizon. This is an open community and there's a, a way to alert everybody, even if you're not a giant channel or you don't have everybody's attention. So that's the Gun Rights Policy Conference, and that's the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, AMCON. So I'm going to encourage people that are able to get to Phoenix to ch check it out. It looks like you can get their special room rate of 119 a night. It's almost positive you're going to find cheaper hotels in Phoenix than 119 a night. So if you're not worried about going to a fancy place, you can find a hotel in Phoenix for cheaper than that, I bet. And if you can't, come into one of the workshops and we'll help, help you figure that out.
All right, with that said, I threw out an email to today to about 40 people, and it looks like everybody's busy. So, uh, you know, whatever. So, I got some people watching, one person watching. I'm seriously talking to myself here. I'll refresh this. All right, we got eight people watching. So, if you have specific questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm curious if anybody is a uh, backer of the Clash Patch Batch, which is what I'm going to be working on this afternoon. I'll refresh this. It looks like we're at, we just passed the 50%, or we just reached the 50% with 888888. So uh, we might finish this campaign. We still have another eight days to go, so a little over a week, and I guess it'll end next Sunday. So uh, we'll see if it if it if it's an all or nothing one. It's a fixed goal, which means that you know, I can't afford to get half the patches made at $800, it would actually cost more to make half the patches than the whole run of patches. So uh, this is an all or nothing. Assuming we get to the uh, goal, though, uh, with a crowdfunding platform like this one, or with Indiegogo, or with a crowdfunding campaign like this, once you reach the goal, uh, everybody gets charged. I, I get the funds after a few days, and then I can pay the manufacturers and then they create them and ship them and then I ship them out to everybody and ideally we are going to have three uh, Kalashnikovs themed patches before uh, Red Dawn Day which is August 10th, the day the anniversary of the movie came out. So uh, we've already designed one a few weeks back or a week ago I guess. Uh, we've designed the AK, kind of a collaborative thing. It's not really a gun that exists. It's an AK-74 that we stuck a metal magazine into so it's sort of a hybrid Kalashnikov-esque gun, but for people who aren't too picky, uh, it's an AKM. Uh, then we drew a second one, which is this Hungarian spam can, a 762 by 54 r Took a bunch of pictures of my spam cans out of the collection there, and this one came out pretty cool. So we sent the, both of these into the manufacturer, and we're waiting on art. And uh, today we're going to draw up the third design, which I uh, said here should be a fun one. I have a couple ideas in mind, but again, I'm checking to see who else is out there uh, that might be a backer. And if you if you are, uh, then feel free to give us some feedback on what you'd like to see for that third one. So uh, I am not interested in just chatting. I'm not here to entertain anybody. So uh, this is a workshop. There's links out to 40-something people. And uh, if they show up, we'll continue on. Otherwise, I've got some drawings to do. So, uh, oh, I guess I dropped it off to my Patreons there. We'll drop that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to the Gun Rights Policy Conference so I can close that window. And again, encourage anybody who hasn't heard of it or might be able to travel in Phoenix or in uh, September to uh, think about joining in Phoenix. And uh, I'm going to quit screen sharing for a minute. I'm going to get my stuff in here and we'll just listen to a podcast I guess so uh, let's see why don't we go I guess I can still screen share for this we'll go look at uh, gun freedom radio see what they've got out there for new podcasts this is uh, Dan and Cheryl Todd out of Phoenix area Click on their on demand tab. Huh, they're just showing re re rerun still. So I guess they're traveling now and not doing shows on the regular. So we'll go listen to uh, Out of Order. Out of Order with James Kalita. Is another awesome podcast. Derek, somebody from Munitions Law Group became, let's see, I don't know what that is, Frank something from the Grief First Foundation, David Powell, Indiana State Rifle and Pistol, Blogger on Gun Politics, Walter Block, Rob Morse. Rob Morse is the Flight Society podcast, and he's one of the people that puts on the AMCON. And we got Masada Yoop, so I'm pretty sure I listen to Masada Yoop already, and I think I listen to Rob Moore, so I think I'm going to scroll up a little bit and listen to what this is all about with the uh, 
Indiana Rifle and Pistol Association. This is the uh, Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast, episode 116. Here you go. It's the Out of Order, um, the James Kalita podcast. It's a awesome podcast where James will just introduce the people and then turns lets them have the mic for like 20 minutes. It's what I model my interviews after, and uh, I asked him if it's okay for me to play his stuff on these workshops since nobody jumps in, and uh, so I'm going to do, and I'm going to get in, uh, I'm going to get my uh, software up and running here, and we'll see if there's any feedback from people with perks. Otherwise, I'll just start drawing something, I guess. Welcome to the Out of Order Podcast, your window into the firearms community, exploring those shaping the future of our rights and protecting our lifestyle, laws, legal cases, activism, and self-defense in a candid and honest podcast for our brothers and sisters in arms. Here's your host, James Kalita. Honest citizens like you protect themselves every day. We talk about it every week on the Self Defense Gun Stories podcast. Were these gun owners lucky or did they have a plan? How should we defend the people we love? We discuss recent examples on the Self Defense Gun Stories podcast. Put us in your pocket. Thanks for tuning in to episode 116 of the Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast. Show notes page for today's episode are out of order james Kalito.com forward slash 116. Today's sponsors are Scott Shop. Whether you are taking a class as a complete beginner or an experienced, highly competent shooter seeking an NRA instructor certification, Scott Shop classes are comfortable, friendly, and fall with a high instructor to ratio. And by the Self Defense Gun Stories Podcast, weekly reports and commentary on civilian self defense. Today's guest is Sue Noble from Indiana State Rifle and Pistol Association. And now, here's Sue. Sue Noble, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Sue, you're the Executive Vice President of the Indiana State Rifle and Pistol Association. Would you tell us a little about that? Uh, the Indiana State Rifle and Pistol Association is the uh, uh, arm of the, um, the state affiliate for the uh, National Rifle Association. Uh, we also partner with um, uh, Midway Foundation, we have the Shooting Sports Foundation, uh, uh, Gun Owners of America to um, uh, basically support Second Amendment um, issues and support shooting sports in Indiana. Uh, right. So how did how did you become involved with the organization? <laughs> I, several years back, um, I had always wanted to, um, I done a lot of fighting as a kid. And had always wanted to kind of get back into it as an adult. I wanted to get um, a gun for self protection, particularly when I, I lived alone uh, by myself. And never really wanted to get a gun until I had time to learn how to do it right. Because I figured uh, 2 o'clock in the morning when somebody's breaking through their, their store is not the time to learn the magazine that they So um, back in uh, 94, um, one of my colleagues, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there, um, retired now, but uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, at the time, a uh, very avid shooter, had shown range um, in here in Indiana, but uh, was getting a group together to go out to a gunfight out, out in Arizona, and wanted me to go along with them, the, the legal and class, they had uh, most of them were taking a shotgun class, and I was going along for a pistol class, and I thought it was a good, good opportunity to uh, maybe get some good instruction, have the time, but the uh, Arizona. I came home hooked. <laughs> it was a great time, great fun. Uh, six of us in Indiana went out. Just had a really, really good time. Um, very, very good class. And, um, it was such a good time. We went out for about four more classes. There's some more classes out there uh, for a vacation. And at, uh, one of the um, instructors out there got me interested in uh, shooting high power. So that was uh, back in '98. Um, I, I. I originally thought it just sounded like watching paint dry, but I tried it anyway and uh, got very actively involved in that. So there, um, um, the, uh, one of the people who was uh, involved with um, organizing the uh, high power event down on the uh, uh, was the uh, vice president for high power for the state association. And when she left, um, she and her husband kind of dropped out to uh, pursue other activities and they needed somebody there to take over and uh, asked me to fill in. And, uh, 
almost uh, 15 years later, there I am. Wow. <laughs> so that's kind of a long, uh, a long story, but uh, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, but the, the, there is that uh, you know that that common theme where you know you go out, uh, you know, and there's that one instance that gets you that gets you hooked. Uh, yeah. But it's so, just a lot of fun, and uh, it's just a great time. A lot of good people in, in the sport. Yes, that's very true. So, what's it like in Indiana for gun owners? What's the what's the the gun law situation? Is it relatively good? Is it is there Generally, generally pretty favorable. We have uh, our, our governor uh, is um, uh, for Second Amendment, and our first lady is an NRA instructor herself. Absolutely outstanding resource and um, Second Amendment supporter, um, avid sports woman. Uh, she's terrific. Uh, Jenna Holcomb. Oh, I can't, oh. can't, can't speak highly enough of um, uh, our um, Indiana uh, is a very good state um, to be gun owner. Excellent. And is there is there anything you guys are, are working on trying to improve? Um, our legislature is in session now. We're in the second half of the um, uh, legislative uh, session right now. Um, we've got a couple bills in the um, uh, one that just passed the house uh, in the Senate right now, uh, working towards strengthening um, um, the laws to protect. Um, Gun owners who, God forbid, are forced to use um, a firearm and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of a great way through the uh, legislation right now, and uh, we'll hopefully that um, will uh, be supported. But, um, right now it's looking pretty good. Excellent. It's so good to hear with so many states that we used to think of as pro gun slowly drifting and this year quickly drifting into anti gun states. Yeah. It's good to hear it's still safe somewhere. In the end, it's still good. You know, with the, the, um, the price of um, freedom is eternal good to us. So, you know, you can't, uh, um, can't let, let your guard down too much. But, um, but yeah, I, right now, Indiana is still a good place. Okay. And you have, uh, you have an event coming up, uh, a concealed carry fashion show. Would you like to tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's the uh, Saturday evening, uh, April 27th. Uh, the NRA convention um, and the meeting and convention will be here in Indianapolis, um, April 26 through 28, and uh, we're really excited about looking forward to that. Uh, that Saturday evening, um, among other events uh, at the convention center in Melbourne, we've got um, up at the uh, Riviera Club in uh, Indianapolis, where uh, we're going to be hosting a um, uh, fashion firearm. It's a concealed carry, but we're calling it concealed with reveal. It's just big options for women. Um, we're also going to include the guys in here, but you know, we're going to have vendors who are going to have holsters of the various and sundry uh, carry options available to show and kind of demonstrate how those can work with um, uh, women's fashion for uh, a lot of different things. Um, you know, women don't particularly want to just be limited to jeans and a uh, tactical desk when they're, they're out and about for business wear or, um, you know, casual um, you know, events. So we, we want to be safe. We want to be protected, but we also want to look good too. So we want to see how um, some of those carrying options will work with some um, um, fashion for women. Yeah, that's Yeah, that's something that's really, uh, really hard. Is you know, a lot of firearm instructors are men, and they just say, you know, dressed for the gun, and that's not really <laughs> practical. Uh, no, it's not I'm, always practical, exactly. So, what kind of things does, what kind of events does ISRPA run uh, throughout the year for its members? Right now, we're uh, primarily uh, focused on the uh, shooting sports. Um, we have uh, state championships uh, throughout the, um, the shooting season. We've got a uh, state championship going on right now up in uh, Fort Wayne. It's a really, really neat event. Uh, Fort Wayne is uh, home to the X Cows, uh, run by uh, Diane Rice and her husband uh, Greg Rice. Great coaches, and Diane runs the um, office and, and general management. Um, they built this facility for uh, junior shooters, for uh, air gun and small bore, um, and they're expecting over the course of uh, three weekends they'll get somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 shooters. Um, it's teams from uh, all over the state, and um, 
and other states as well. So it's a uh, really exciting uh, event. Uh, we also have uh, high power, um, uh, high power being a center fire um, up to a better caliber, um, free position and or long range. Uh, we're actually able to shoot long range uh, out to thousand yards, maybe beyond that, down at the uh, military side of that battery. So they're uh, uh, state sanctioned them, uh, uh, state sanctioned them at the uh, we, we function those matches as the uh, state affiliate, uh, and then the uh, host club uh, actually uh, carry out this thing too. So we've got, uh, I believe we've got small bore, we've got uh, air rifle, we've got quarter air rifle, uh, several different high power events at uh, the youth course, um, 100 yards, 300 yards, and uh, the full course for high power is uh, a shot at 200, 600 yards. Very few ranges can actually accommodate that kind of um, Range, that kind of yardage. So they do a visually induced course on 100 yards um, and up to uh, 300 yards. Uh, and so, what can people listening throughout the country? How can they how can they help you guys? Um, check out our website. Check us out on Facebook. Um, contact us. Uh, let us know what uh, what kind of events you'd like to see. Um, come to the Passion Firearms event. We've got uh, tickets on sale now. Um, oh, okay, got tickets on sale. All right. And so, do you have it? Like, just so people have an idea, do you, you know how many different types of holsters, or, or how many, or how many, uh, I don't know, models is the right way to ask, but how many models are gonna, going to be there? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, still in the planning stage, and I'm doing more with that. Uh, Coordinating the event and the stage and kind of the next few days of it. And then um, Amanda uh, Suffolk and um, John Hillier are working with me to uh, get the models arranged. And so I've, um, the three of us are kind of working together, and, and I'm not quite sure. I'm well versed on how many and, and what uh, the details of the model are. It'll be a surprise. Oh, yeah, and it, it really does sound like it's going to be a, a great event because we see all these holsters advertised, you know, that. Sometimes you look at them and you're like, I can't imagine that would work. And they're all, you know, twenty-five dollar, thirty, fifty dollar holsters to, you know, to bring it home. So yeah, this is the Century one they did, and then Magpul did this one. This is a sticker, and then Five Eleven ripped them both off by doing this one. So there's already quite a few few Banana Mag ones. I don't think anybody knows what a Banana Mag is anymore. And looks like somebody on Etsy did this one or Pinterest, I guess. I guess I'll go back to the thing. I find out that it doesn't quite look right or doesn't quite exactly. operate right. It doesn't, no. doesn't quite fit the gun, doesn't fit the bell, doesn't fit the. Uh, doesn't look right with what, whatever you're wearing or what to wear it with. And usually quite a bit of money sunk in. Um, accessories, um, and then have a whole drawer full, a whole closet full of them that um, you, you wish you had a chance to try before you bought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, definitely sounds like something people should check out. And that ensuring the NRA convention is, is going to be great because you'll get people from all over the country. Exactly. A lot of the vendors, uh, vendors that will be there at the um, uh, NRA convention uh, will also have um, some uh, products available at the uh, Fashion Firearms Show. So if you see something that you like at Fashion Firearms, you can go back to the uh, convention on uh, Sunday. Uh, we will have, I believe some of the um, vendors will have uh, products for sale at the Fashion Firearms, um, but uh, we'll also have um, the whole NRA convention at the event. If you see something you like, you can go back down and uh, either order or purchase it. I, have, I always ask my guests if they have books that they recommend that every gun owner should read, whether about firearms or history or politics. Any, any come to mind? Oh my gosh, um, I think there, there's several, um, several out there. I've recently gotten involved with the uh, United States Concealed Carry Association. Several good books out. Um, I just got a catalog for the uh, NRA store, and they've got uh, a lot of options. Um, a lot of good videos out there. Um, Depending on what you're interested in, whether it's um, uh, Second Amendment um, legislation, uh, 
tactics, uh, different events, different uh, types of shooting. Uh, there's a lot out there, and a lot of a lot of videos out now. Uh, some of them very good. Um, the um, uh, gun fight where I originally started has um, so shot out there that have a lot of good stuff. Uh, like good stuff. Directing my brain to <laughs> just oh, right right. here, but, uh, but yeah, there's so many options. So, you you mentioned in the beginning that you you know you grew up linking, but you wanted training before you got a firearm for defensive uh, purposes. Is there advice you would have for women in a similar situation? You know, what kind of training, where, or uh, or, or what type of firearm, or anything like that? There's so many good options available, and there's so many good uh, organizations out there.
Thanks for tuning in to episode 116 of the Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast. The show notes page for today's episode is outoforderjamescalina.com forward slash 116. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Episode 117. So Tony was saying the, um, what do you call it, that Kalashnikov picture, but that guy, there's already a patch of that, so I'm going to see if I can find it. It's the same company that makes these, I think. I just don't have one. Anyway, those real photo realistic types are difficult. This one's not too bad, actually. But the one at Kalashnikov, um, I mean, you can tell what it is, but it looks like our October ones. I mean, they definitely look like a sewn picture. So they, you know, they don't look great. So, uh, I don't know. I haven't had great success doing images of people. A thing is pretty simple because it's got straight lines and stuff. I'm going to figure out I gotta figure out what company. It might be the same company that makes this one. Because it was basically the same picture. This picture here is a patch. So they just did it as a brighter patch. Monkey holding a banana look like an AK. Uh, an idea. A bear walking with it strapped to its back. So, the bear walking away? Thing is, I don't know. I mean, I guess you're saying like a Russian bear? Okay, a big Russian bear with an AK. How about a monkey holding an AK? I don't know. Is that monkey holding an AK in Planet of the Apes, the new one? Holding an AK? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Does he even hold an AK in a movie? Talking about a bunch of cants. Russian bears are so into themselves. Okay. what the monkey is like that's not like a running joke with any of our stuff or anything i don't know if there's anything to do with anything so i'm gonna keep digging what the hell is all this oh that this was the uh, illinois state rifle and pistol association that they were just talking to over on james Cleta's podcast so i'm going to link to that on both the chats again how about an ar trying to change into an ak Mm, not that bright, maybe? I don't know where you're going. You're talking about a patch here. Crazy person off their bananas? I'm not sure. I'm gonna, okay, Dave Powell, founder of CA Against Gun Control. I guess that's California, I bet. Honest citizens like you protect themselves every day. We talk about it every week on the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Were these gun owners lucky, or did they have a plan? How should we defend the people we love? We discuss recent examples on the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Put us in your pocket. Welcome to the Out of Order podcast, your window into the firearms community, exploring those shaping the future of our rights and protecting our lifestyle, laws, legal cases, activism, and self-defense in a candid and honest podcast for our brothers and sisters in arms. Here's your host, James Kalita.
Thanks for tuning in to episode 117 of the Out of Order Done Rights podcast. So let's pay for today's episode. It is time for order.com forward slash 117. Today's guest is David Powell. Today's sponsors are Scott Shot. Whether you are taking a class as a complete beginner or an experienced, highly competent shooter seeking an NRA instructor certification, Scott Shot classes are comfortable, friendly, and taught with a high instructor to student ratio. And by the Self Defense Gun Stories podcast, weekly reports and commentary on civilian self defense. David Powell, welcome to the show. Yep, thank you very much, bud. David, you're one of the founders of California Supposing Gun Restrictions. Would you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, sir. It's a gun rights group that was uh, strictly started on um, a grassroots basis. And we've grown since. Uh, we started up, I think, in 2011, and we grew up to about 35,000 members. Wow, that's incredible. What was your, how did you, how did you manage to grow that fast and uh, uh, get that much numbers? Well, um, we did certain things in California uh, that a lot of people don't do. Um, our gun rights group, what we did when we first started up, we physically actually went to the Capitol, had protests, went to hearings, spoke in opposition. We did everything that people say, you know, certain other, certain other groups just don't do uh, in California. For instance, and I don't mean the bathroom, but the NRA in California has been basically non existent So we took it upon ourselves to create a new organization, and that's what we did. And, I mean, we, we got pretty big notoriety for doing, which is going to sound crazy, a filibuster in California. And we weren't just like a reading from the Bible or anything like that. We had about 2,000 gun owners go up to the Capitol and sit in a hearing, and we kept them in session for 17 hours. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now that is you can't really do that Oh, okay. They change the law, or they... Uh, oh, yeah. They made that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we tried to do that in New Jersey, and, and they just cut everybody off in a few minutes. Um, yeah, that's what they do yeah. in California. And if you, um, you, you can't say why you're supposed to or why you're against it. It's either you're for it or you're against it. And the second you start speaking, they cut you off. Wow, that is. Mm-hmm. So, 35,000, I think a lot of people think of California as being just completely liberal. <laughs> like, the last no. gun owner left a year ago. What's it, what's it really like? What's it really like? Okay, so, um, basically, you have two counties that run the entire state. Okay, you have L.A. County and San Francisco, the Bay Area. One is one county, but we just count San Francisco as a whole is super lucky. Um, uh, the northern part of the state, except maybe Humboldt County, is very conservative. In fact, about 70% of the state is actually very conservative. The problem is you have 50, over 50% of the population that lives in two counties, and they have to say over the state. Basically, what California has turned into is an oligarchy. And um, because of that, you have mob rule. And so if 51% of the people say they want one thing, the other 49% of the people say they don't even matter at all. So it's literally mob rule at this point, And uh, there's nothing we can do. We have no work. Uh, so what are some of the things that this organization is working on? Well, sadly, the organization kind of died out after I left California. Um, one of our, the, the founding members lost their home recently to a campfire in Pico, and her health completely, her health completely burned down, gave up. Um, one of the other founders actually uh, helped, helped out quite a lot with gun owners in California, who was partners with gun owners in America, and the organization basically died. Um, it, it's kind of sad. Uh, I lived so close to the Capitol at one point where I just go there before I went to work and spoke up this. But I, I moved to Nevada uh, for a better job, um, but the guarantee job I was selling firearms now, which is funny. Um, but the organization kind of died, and I really wish someone would have um, took over the reins and, you know, uh, did something with it, but it didn't go anywhere. It's been dead for basically two years. So, I, I've had the experience of living in a, you know, in New Jersey, it was very restrictive, and Pennsylvania, that was much less restrictive. And, you know, I find, 
two different sets of problems, and I wonder if your experience has been similar. When, when I was in New Jersey, you know, people would either be indifferent to firearms, and then as they became, you know, enthusiastic about firearms, the, the most most enthusiastic ones would leave, uh, you know, because they, you know, want their guns. Uh, but then you'd, you'd have trouble, you'd have like this Christian period where people would, would uh, you know, sort of fade out. But then in the less restricted state, there's almost apathy in that people don't think that the threat's there, that it's not coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly how it is here in Nevada. And people in Nevada, uh, they need to wake the hell up very quickly because we are now up in the state. Which sucks because of only one county in the We have 17 counties. Nevada has Facebook turned into East California, that's what we call it. And they get run with the entire state. Uh, the worst part about this whole thing is everybody treats the state in, not Carson City, as the capital of Nevada. Whatever they say goes, and no one else's voice is allowed to 16 other threats to come. That voice means nothing at all. That's, and is that because, again, because of the population density? Or that uh, yeah, that's yeah, they have a huge population density in one little tiny city. And the rest of the state is, you know, it's kind of deserted. But that doesn't mean that their voice does matter. And it's not fair uh, for states to do this, uh, for California or Nevada or any other state. What we want in uh, Nevada, uh, which would actually help California as well, is to change our uh, voting system here to be like uh, the Electoral College. That way it looks so basically to the people who um, right. And it would be the same with California. It would be the same way. If they, if they, if they ever adopted the same thing, we'd say, well, because they, you know, they, they don't like their Electoral College that Trump won, even though he lost the, the um, popular vote, only because it was illegal and voted. Um, but yeah, they won't do that. Right, and that's the, uh, that's sort of the paradox, right, is that the, yeah. you know, it, it's, we, you know, the country as a whole does not want to see, does not want to be run the way California is run, where you know really dense population centers make decisions for for rural people. And yeah, so yeah, so do you think uh, that that is going to succeed in uh, in, in changing the uh, the election process? No. And okay. the reason why I said that is because we have a, uh, a Democratic governor with a Democratic majority, and that will never happen. Uh, like I said, it, it, it just won't happen. The Democrats don't like the Electoral College in the United States because they, they see that as a threat to um, um, to vote. Um, and we won't get back here until our state turns right again. There's no way it's going to happen until we turn. And that, that's going to be tough. You know, because once states go blue, they usually stay blue. Right. Yeah. So, right now, are there gun laws proposed in Nevada's area. And they're completely ridiculous. Um, I keep calling it East California, and this is why. Um, they want us to go to private party background checks in Nevada. So even if you have a CCW, you have to go to a gun shop, fill out 44 signature, and go to actual, another background check just to get that money. And, or uh, privately. Uh, Nevada, as it stands right now, um, you, you could be on the street, buy a gun, and walk away. Well, the only thing you really could do is make sure that they are the rapper residents. You can't, you, you know, you can't be a California resident and do that. You can't be a California resident by any other state except California. But we're so close to California that they, they get to be all the time. And I feel bad for them, but they can't do that. Right. Um, yeah. And that's a better other, a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the California... The Californian come here privately with his own firearm and sell their gun shop. That's totally fine. But um, a lot of them don't do that. Uh, and I would say wouldn't. And the reason why is keep those guns in California. California, of all places, can sell guns in the other place. Yeah, that's really, that's really true. So are you yeah. involved in any groups down there in Nevada now? Um, I'm slowly getting involved in it. Uh, I've been here for a little bit less than two years. Um, uh, I do go to hearings at Capitals as we try to speak about this here, but they just don't let us. Um, we had a huge, um, um, well, our first meeting at the Capitol um, regarding the third party background check. Uh, 
you know, making the population of eligible people smaller and smaller. And that's one of the ways they Absolutely. do it. They make these yeah. laws that you know, people don't know they're breaking, and then all of a sudden there's a whole yeah. group of people that aren't qualified. Or a whole yeah. group of people that never buy guns because they're like, oh, I have a roommate, so I can't own guns. And, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, not only that, check this out. Um, in SB 43, they kind of, kind of smack this one in there in the law that they're creating a central repository for guns. We all know what that means. It's obvious that they want to have some sort of gun registration because in Nevada, we don't have that. It doesn't ever get registered to anyone. You got the background check, you walk. That's it. But they're creating a central repository. Mm -hmm. I think it's on like page four in SB 143. I've wrote the whole thing like a million times. Customers come in and ask about it, so I find out. Well, uh, David, I always ask my guests if there are any books they recommend that every gun owner read. Are there any that you uh, think that everyone should read? Um, well, I don't want to really say it online, but Patriot's Cookbook, maybe. All right. <laughs> yeah. It'll be fun to find I'm being, I'm just, I'm just being serious, and I know it's hard to find. I know it's been banned, um, but it's still out there. And I would just read up on it. Keep copy. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty steep. You could you'd have what you want, and they can't really say that you can't. I mean, they could say that, but that's whatever. You know. So, any normally I would put a link to the organization. Should I put a link up to California's opposing gun restrictions? Or yeah, uh, I, I, it's only on Facebook, and we're okay. highly restricted on there. So it's uh, you know Facebook.com forward slash uh, Californians opposing gun restrictions. Well, I thank you very much for being on the show. Any any parting words for our listeners? Don't sell your guns. Excellent. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming on. And look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks again for tuning in to episode 117 of the Out of Order Gun Rides podcast. Show notes page for today's episode is outoforderjamescolita.com forward slash 117. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. All right. Well, that was David Powell. I haven't heard of that guy before. I couldn't find him anywhere online either. So the only thing you can find is James' podcast there. So anybody that doesn't value your voice, I challenge you. There's people you can talk to that nobody else are going to, and that might be their encouragement to keep going. Who knows what that guy's going to do or what, but anyway, so we got a uh, Liberty First Foundation. I've never heard of this. Anybody ever heard of this thing before? Frank Johnson, Liberty First Foundation. Let's see what this is all about. Out of Order Gun Rides Podcast, episode 118. Honest citizens like you. Wow, this guy has a Three letter URL. I mean, it's a dot US, but still one F. Uh, what is it? One. No, L one F dot US. That's difficult. Typically, you don't see a lot of three letter domain names. That's pretty cool. Who protect themselves every day. We talk about it every week on the Self Defense Gun Stories podcast. Were these gun owners lucky, or did they have a plan? How should we defend the people we love? We discuss recent examples on the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Put us in your pocket. Welcome to the Out of Order podcast, your window into the firearms community, exploring those shaping the future of our rights and protecting our lifestyle, laws, legal cases, activism, and self-defense in a candid and honest podcast for our brothers and sisters in arms. Here's your host, James Kalita. Today's sponsors are Scott Shot. Whether you are taking a class as a complete beginner or an experienced, highly competent shooter seeking an NRA instructor certification, Scott Shot classes are comfortable, friendly, and taught with a high instructor to student ratio. And by the Self Defense Gun Stories podcast, weekly reports and commentary on civilian self defense. Thanks for tuning in to episode 118 of the Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast. Show notes page for today's episode is outofordergamescolita.com forward slash 118. 
Today's guest is Frank Johnson, one of the founders of the Liberty First Foundation. And now, here's Frank. Frank Johnson, welcome to the show. James, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on tonight. My pleasure. So, Frank, you're one of the co-founders of the Liberty First Foundation. Would you tell us a little about that organization? All right. Uh, the Liberty First Foundation started about a year ago, give or take. Uh, what started out as a Facebook group called the Religion of Wrongs, uh, we... A core group of people who originally founded that uh, started to soon discover that there was a lot of passion involved in the Second Amendment just in that group, and that we could maybe have the potential of turning it into something more than just a Facebook group and turn it more towards activism, uh, political engagement, maybe do some events and, and things of that nature. And uh, before you know it, things just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger until we started seeing that uh, we had the opportunity to develop state chapters, put people in leadership positions, uh, uh, like I said, help organize different events, get behind certain pieces of legislation or stand in protest of other pieces of legislation. Uh, it, we, we didn't want to market ourselves as a, a Second Amendment group with the Liberty First Foundation. We wanted to pretty much market ourselves as a civil rights organization that's primarily focused on the Second Amendment. You know, we, we thought to ourselves that if we were to come in under the, you know, the gun guy group of America, you know, rah, rah, trying to get into some politician's door, we wouldn't probably get too far. But if we came in under the Liberty First Foundation, well, who's opposed to liberty? So right. we figured that that would give us a little bit of an in where uh, religion of arms may not have opened up so many doors. Liberty First Foundation would have a little bit of uh, instant credibility. And so far, we've been very fortunate to find that we have. Excellent. So have you have you started many state chapters yet? Uh, as of right now, I believe that we have 37 out of our 50 states have a chapter leader that has been uh, interviewed by at least six different people, uh, has been put into place, has been giving not marching orders, but sort of a guideline of what we kind of expect from our, our state chapter leaders as far as helping organize events, try to get people in contact with other people, try to find these small groups that have limited amounts of people in them to try and consolidate their efforts into, into um, one umbrella. Uh, so I think we're, we're in around 37. We're always looking for more people to come in and help. As you can imagine, uh, you know, if you're in a call with five people and you want to find out where to go for dinner, you're going to get six different answers. So, yep. uh, you know, when you have uh, 50 state groups and you're trying to put at least two leaders in each state, you're talking 100 people, that's 100 personalities, and they all have to coincide with one another. And uh, the founders of the group, it's, uh, it's a bit daunting, but uh, we're, we're getting there. We're getting for, hey, for a year's worth of work and we've come this far, I think it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. So what kind of projects are you guys working on? Uh, well, right now, if you look at what's going on out in uh, uh, Washington State, for instance, with 1639, uh, a lot of a couple of our founders have been working behind the scenes to help doing a lot of the research about the laws that they've introduced out there in the legislation that we've helped draft in order to overturn 1639 or at least act as a countermeasure so that we could potentially repeal it. Because 1639 was brought into the forum under dubious circumstances, to say the least. Uh, we were heavily involved with that. A lot of the other uh, states, we're, one of the things that we've been working on is trying to reach out to the state sheriffs as an um, uh, outreach program for trying to establish more of our sanctuary city policies as far as the Second Amendment are concerned. Like if you, like I'm here in New York, and if you drew a, a line down just about a third of New York, you have about 20, count, 20 counties on the western part of New York where all of the state sheriffs have already said that they're not going to be instituting any more of the SAFE Act policies. Uh, the SAFE Act is by far one of the most notorious restrictive gun laws that's on the books in any state. And Governor Cuomo just keeps making it more and more restrictive without uh, opening the forum up to public opinion, without getting any information from people in the firearms industry. They're relying on old skewed data and basically whatever makes them feel better. Well, we are trying to recruit more and more sheriffs to come in and say, hey, listen, you know, you guys took an oath that you were going to stand for the, the Constitution. 
And the Second Amendment is up there pretty high for a reason. And 20 sheriffs in New York State so far have signed on and said that they're not going to do it. We're hoping to enlist more. And you've seen a lot of that movement in a lot of other states. So wherever we see that there's some sort of a movement, we've been trying to put on members in places where they could use their time to facilitate reaching out to these sheriffs, reaching out to various district attorneys, uh, other law enforcement agencies that are out there. Uh, even some state uh, trooper, uh, state uh, police departments are not thrilled with some of the, the laws that are being put out there because they know that they're being put more at risk, not from the average gun owner, but from the criminals that pay no mind to these gun laws that they put out. So we have an ally in our in our corner. It's just a matter of trying to bridge that gap so that we all speak the same language, so we all understand that we're all under the same penalty and under the same threat. So that's what we've been trying to do. We have a couple of other things we'll, we'll probably get to that are a little a little bit more fun oriented, but uh, we can discuss those if you want. So in New York, when when you get the sheriffs to sign on and uh, you know, refuse to enforce parts of the SAFE Act. How does that translate for the everyday person? Because the you know the gun dealers still have to follow gun laws, and the uh, you know and, and you know the sheriffs aren't you know involved in the day to day you know going to people's homes, pulling people over. So there, there's still I think, or is there still a good chance that someone might be arrested for you know having a collapsible stock or a pistol grip? There is there is a, a pretty good chance uh, in New York State you have uh, a pretty defined line between the New York State Police and your county sheriffs. Your New York State Police pretty much follow a set of guidelines, a set of marching orders, because they're under the direct purview of the executive branch of the state, meaning the governor. So whatever they say from Albany is pretty much disseminated down the line, and that's the rules they have to follow. But the state troopers only have a limited amount of authority as far as where they patrol, what they do. You'll primarily see them on highways and everything. But when you get into your smaller towns, you'll see that it's your sheriff's offices that are out there doing it because they're by the county. Now, remember, constitutionally speaking, the sheriff, the county sheriff is the only uh, police organization that's mentioned in the Constitution. There are no state police. There are no... New York City Police Department, it's county sheriff. The county sheriff is the only constitutionally mandated police agency. So in New York State, we also have to take into consideration that the issuing authority for permits is the county. It's generally a judge that signs off on the permit, all your application processes all go through your county sheriff office. Uh, so the, the sheriffs have a certain amount of control as far as the permitting processes, where the state police have a little bit more control as far as arresting authority for violations. One of the violations that people have been uh, getting turned up on their head about is the uh, magazine capacity. Uh, in New York State, the original, when the Safe Act first came out, they first wanted to limit it to five rounds capacity that you could have in a firearm. Uh, and then somebody woke up and realized, well, most revolvers are six rounds, so that wasn't going to fly, so they upped it to six. And then they started getting a little bit of pushback, saying, well, all of these people who had their firearms, whether it was a 1911, which has a seven-round capacity, or a Beretta 92 with a 15-round capacity, they were all going to have to have to take their magazines and have them destroyed or modified and have a letter of modification signed off on by a, a gunsmith and have that certified by the, the the, the county police or state trooper agency would have to be certified by somebody that they would only hold up to 10 rounds. But the law mandated that you were only allowed to carry seven. So you could have a magazine that would hold 10 rounds, but a magaz but a capacity limit that said you were only allowed seven. So there is a, 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 there is a lot of ambiguity in that law that says, well, is it seven or is it 10? Because we've had people in New York State that have been arrested and, and tried and convicted for carrying eight rounds of ammunition in their firearm because they had a magazine that held seven rounds, had one in the chamber, there was eight rounds. They're all of a sudden in violation. They've committed a, a, a Class B felony in the state of New York. We have, uh, a couple, we have one case right now that's on its way to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, 
it was one on appeal and hopefully this is going to be the first thing that really puts a kink in the chain as far as the safe act is concerned it can hopefully bring a lot of it down uh, uh this gentleman was convicted of having more than seven rounds now my my everyday carry is a beretta 92 i, I have a 10 round magazine in it uh if i want to be in compliance i have to have six in the magazine one in the chamber now i i don't necessarily know if god forbid if i should ever ever happen to use that firearm in a self-defense situation and the person that is trying to kill me may not decide he wants or she wants to you know adhere to the safe fact they may have 15 rounds puts right. me at a bit of a strategic disadvantage but at least after they find my body and they you know draw the chalk line they don't have to worry about convicting me for having more than the allotted rounds that the governor thinks i don't need to defend myself <laughs> you know so uh it's there's a like I said, there's a tremendous amount of pushback most of your state troopers if you get them off record are going to tell you that the safe act has done nothing but made their jobs harder uh the county sheriffs most of them will tell you off the record that they're not in favor of it that they do believe that it does not make the state any safer in fact that makes us a more vulnerable state and those guys probably you know if they if you have a 10 round magazine and you have 10 rounds they're probably not going to wind up you know you know getting you hooked up on it but you don't want to run the risk now everybody can come out and say well you know i will not comply i will not comply that that's fine but until you're on the other end of those handcuffs and you spent twenty thirty thousand dollars in defense fees uh you know you've had your gun stricken away from you you've been sitting in a jail cell for six months or more you've had you lost your job you've had your children removed from your house because they're going to use it as some sort of grounds to say that you had an unsafe living condition for your children uh you lost your job you lost your wife you lost your whatever whatever else you're going to lose but you can still say i did not comply I, I will not comply is fine but until we have the three million new york state registered voters that are gun owners decide that they're not going to comply and all stand unified they're just going to wind up taking everybody out one by one by one until there's enough of an outcry that the laws get changed and that's going to be extremely time consuming and extremely expensive and you know so we're, we're hoping that uh, the, the case that's coming up to the supreme court now is going to be the one that that helps the most as far as new york is concerned uh, what started out as uh, a transportation lawsuit, uh, this guy managed to fold a couple of cases into one, but he wanted to be able to travel from New York to Long Island, uh, from New York State, in the upstate area of the Catskills, down to New to Long Island without being a felon through the five boroughs. Because as soon as you cross over the George Washington and the Tappan Zee Bridge or you get anywhere into the, any of the five boroughs if you have a firearm even though you have a new york state carry permit you're a felon as soon as you hit the five boroughs new york city doesn't recognize your permit it's not until you get out into long island where you get into nassau and suffolk county that they'll start to recognize your permit again so for that uh 65 mile trek going out you know you're you're in a world of hurt if you should happen to get pulled over and down there any chance they get of exploiting somebody for a gun violation they're going to take it so you will be on the newspaper you will be on the news uh you will get prosecuted there's very the very few of the cops in new york city are going to have prosecutorial discretion because uh they're all wearing body cameras now so it's not like somebody can say oh well you know we understand just you know get you know those days are long gone that don't happen everybody plays cya and uh yeah. you're gonna go to jail and that's another reason why the state troopers aren't gonna let you get away with anything either as long as right. they have a body camera on them you're gonna go right yeah so, so you mentioned that uh, that guys are involved in some fun things too want to tell us about those um well one of the things that we we wanted to do we realized that every time that we looked around and we saw somebody having one of these rallies at a state capitol someplace it's always on a Saturday. It's always sometime in January or February. Wind is blowing, snow is falling, and none of the elected representatives are out there to actually see the hundreds or thousands of people that show up at any one of these gun rallies. The only thing they wind up seeing is a bunch of people with banners and signs and the media 
twist that to however which way they want to and with whatever message they want into it. So we thought to ourselves about, well, how could we have something as a national rally? And the idea about, you know, marching on Washington, D.C. came up. But logistically, there's, there's a transportation issue for, you know, 75 million of us who are not going to be able to get to Washington, D.C. on the same day at the same time. So we thought, well, what is something that we could all do, that we could all participate in from a local level? And we had the idea about formulating National Range Day. And somebody said, well, what would you want to do for National Range Day? And I said, well, we thought about it. And so we had 50 states. If we could get two or more ranges from every state to participate in an open house event on the same day, at the same time, we would give an opportunity for tens upon tens of thousands of American gun owners and gun enthusiasts to go to a range that's somewhat local to them and participate in America's largest family-friendly shooting event. And that would be whatever range that it would be, whatever events that they could facilitate, whether it's skeet and trap or, or bullseye tournaments or rimfire rifle from 50 feet, 100 feet, long distance shooting, whatever the range could facilitate, let them facilitate it. We wouldn't have anything specific as far as what anybody would have to do, except one thing. We want to broadcast it live. Nice. We want to have a member of the Liberty First Foundation yeah. or the Religion of Arms as a you know brother-sister organization at each range with a cell phone or a tablet or laptop computer and a Wi-Fi connection or a hotspot and be able to broadcast the events from each range directly to our Facebook page, our website, to Twitter, and to every social media platform that we could possibly get onto and flood the entirety of the Internet with Americans exercising their Second Amendment. And we thought that that would probably be a great way to tag every single politician in America and say, you know, you kind of ignore us, you know, for the 364 days of the year that we're not voting. But here's a day where you can actually see just how many of us are out here in strength doing what we do and doing what we love to do. And let it be a little bit of a reminder to them that the Second Amendment community is not just a group of people. It's a group of very well-armed, well-trained, passionate people that are a little tired of having their rights being trampled on by people who live behind big, giant walls with armed guards and safe communities and tell us that we don't have the right to defend ourselves with more than five rounds. So that's what National Range Day was geared to be. It was geared to be an event that we could all participate in. Uh, if you go to our website, which is uh, uh, l1f.us, uh, you'll see National Range Day 2019. If you pull that tab down, you could read all about what Range Day is. And if you want to get in contact with us, we're going to have an interactive map that's going to be debuting sometime in the beginning of April where all the ranges that are participating, and we have quite a few, uh, it'll be an interactive map where you can find the ranges that are participating. And if you have a range that you want to suggest that says, hey, my range might want to get involved with this, send their information along to us. Or if you want to reach out to them yourself and say, hey, uh, Liberty First Foundation is putting on National Range Day. Maybe we could get in on that. Any bit of help that we can get is not helping us. It's helping the Second Amendment community. You know, and it's just helping foster our ability to defend our rights that much easier when people know how many of us there are that are willing to take a day and spend it with the time, well, spend the time with our families, with our friends, with people who maybe never shot before, uh, bring them to a range. It'll be about education, gun safety. Uh, we have a lot of parameters that we've asked as far as having range safety officers being mandated on every range that participates, uh, firearm instructors. Uh, if uh, a group can, uh, if a range has a, uh, you know, anybody who's an expert in a particular field, have them come in as an instructor. If it's something that they're qualified to do, let them come in and do it. If somebody wants to maybe not even pick up a gun, but just want to watch what happens, have set a viewing station up for people to come in 
and let them learn about the first, the, the Second Amendment. Have somebody there teach the history of the Second Amendment. It would be a great way to reach out to the community so that we could finally paint the picture of ourselves with a with a paintbrush of truth rather than the paintbrush that the media and politicians have been painting us for far too long. I like it. That's, all excellent. Think. That's a really good point to make about getting people out is, you know, it's, there are so many rallies. I, you know, I, I think this is going to be, we got one coming up in March and it's the fourth one this year. And it's hard to get people out when you have an annual rally, but when you have multiple rallies, people start to think, well, oh, I went to the last one or I'll get to the next one. And yeah, it's right. It's really hard to make well, rallies well, awesome. Make it like can, carnivals so that people can't wait to get seeds, to the next one. So Come on. Across the country. Don't be defeatist. And everybody found a seed close to them. They could go and they could, you know, water it a little bit themselves. Add a little bit of themselves to that endeavor. And maybe we can get the whole thing to grow. Because if we have it all in one spot, like I said, nobody, it's going to be so hard for everybody to get there. Uh, and for instance, we had, we had SHOT Show this past year. Uh, myself and my girlfriend of, of our organization, we were the only two that were physically able to get to SHOT Show. We, when we were there, we met a lot of other people from the Religion of Arms and Liberty First Foundation who were there as members. But as far as uh, founders and admins, we were the only ones who were able to get there because... Like I said, we're, we're a, a brand new organization. We're working pretty much out of our own pocket. We haven't uh, set up anything along the lines where we can take donations, although we do have a GoFundMe page for people to help us with uh, getting to the NRA convention uh, come up in April because we want to have six people there to cover that event because as much as, as much as we covered at SHOT Show, the NRA event is going to be even bigger and we need a lot more people. And, being that I just had my knee replaced three days ago, it's a lot more walking than I'm physically able to, to do. Right. But uh, like I said, we, we, we're trying to do everything that we can from as from as meager a source of income and a, a, as small a, a talent pool as we possibly have. And we're just trying to grow and expand on it to be as grassroots as possible, but we need help. And I get frustrated a lot. A lot of the guys yell at me sometimes because I... I don't pull punches. I'm very outspoken. If I, if I see something that's not right, something I got to say about it. You know, if you ask everybody to, you know, post their favorite meme, you know, on a thread on Facebook, you'll get three, four, five hundred pitches show up in ten minutes. Yeah. If, if you ask the same five hundred people, can everybody make a phone call to their congressman or their senator tomorrow? Nada. You get crickets. Yep. If we post in our group that we're giving away a box of ammo, you know, and we and we give away a lot of stuff on our group. We give away a lot of stuff, stuff that's either donated to us by our few sponsors, and our sponsors are not donating to us monetarily. Our sponsors are donating things for us to give away people in the group. So, you know, we'll ask, hey, if we're doing a giveaway, and well, before you know it, you have know, bells and whistles everywhere. But if we say, hey, listen, can you share this very important article? You know, activism is more than sitting at your keyboard and just complaining about what the NRA isn't doing or what the gun owners of America is doing. Activism is a matter of what you're doing. And if you're not doing, then you're not an activist. You may be a practitioner of the Second Amendment, but you're not an activist of the Second Amendment. Unless you're actively putting on your boots getting in your car, going to a rally, writing a letter, making a phone call, going to one of these events, as silly as the media will try and portray us, walking around with our sign that says, shall not be infringed, we can take those slings and arrows, because if we can't take that level of criticism, I doubt we're going to be able to uh, take projectiles of a more substantial basis. You know, we, we have to get engaged in this fight now because if a dark day comes, it's it's not going to be something that we want. You know, you, you know, we say that we're prepared and everybody goes back to the uh, uh, the Hirohito uh, you know, thing about uh, a rifle behind every blade of grass. But, you know, sometimes the guy holding the rifle gets shot back at. 
we don't want to get to that point in America. We've already had a situation in this country where 800,000 people uh, gave their lives for the cause of freedom. And I don't ever want to see that. Not in my lifetime, not in the lifetime of my kids or your kids or anybody else's kids. I would rather we win this fight on the virtue of freedom and the virtue of what our founding fathers stood for and let it people remember that the struggle that they just finished with and fighting with Great Britain was why they wrote that in the, into the Constitution, why that is there, why that's guaranteed to us. And if we can't make that simple sacrifice of sharing articles, making phone calls, attending events, for God's sake, Range Day is going to be a fantastic event. There is absolutely no reason why, unless you're physically incapable of getting to a range why somebody shouldn't want to go to range day this is going to be a fantastic event you're going to meet people in your community people that you probably didn't even realize are going on those you're going to find that you're going to find a lot of friendships a lot of camaraderie and you're going to find a lot more support maybe that little bit of support is what's going to invigorate the second amendment community to the point where we start feeling that passion again you know, uh, you know, this idea of, well, they're not coming for my hunting rifle. Yeah, they are. Right. They're coming yeah. for your hunting rifle. They're, they're coming for your shotgun. They're coming for your black powder gun. Believe me when I tell you, they're coming for it. If we don't stand up now and get involved with, I'm not telling you to get involved with my organization. I mean, we're, we're a little blip on the radar. I mean, we're, we're lucky when we get an interview that we're able to, you know, share some of what we do. But get involved with some of the groups, even if you don't like them. God's sake, get your name out there. You know, get on that list so they can bolster one more person on the list. If you don't have a pistol permit, if you're in a state that requires it, even if you don't want to carry a firearm, get your pistol permit. Because your state might not know how many people have what guns, but they know how many people in your state have a pistol permit. And if you have a state like New York, where we only have 600,000 registered pistol permits in the state of New York, imagine how much different politicians would look at our state if there were 3 million pistol permit holders. Yeah. yeah. You know, you might not want the gun, but if you're not ready to defend the Second Amendment, there might be another right somewhere in that Bill of Rights that you think is important that... Maybe that's the one they'll come after after they get rid of number two. So you got to do something. You got to get involved. Even if guns aren't your thing, for God's sake, uh, there's a lot more at stake than just one, you know, than just the ability to go out hunting. There's a lot more at stake than that. And I, I just wish personally that a lot more that more people would see it and that they would treat it with the uh, uh, the ferocity. And the urgency that I see it with. So, Frank, I always ask my guests if there are books that they recommend that all gun owners should read, either about politics or firearms or training. Any come to mind? Well, if you want to look for anything about maintenance of firearms, uh, look up anything that you can find, whether it's a book, an article, a pamphlet, anything by Doug Turnbull. Uh, D-O-U-G-T-U-R-N-B-U-L-L. Uh, if you want to know what, uh, I mean, Doug Turnbull is a legend. Uh, as far as, in my mind, he's a legend. The guy is outstanding. Uh, what he does with firearm restorations is fantastic. And, you know, if you're going to, if you want to know how to maintain your firearm, you want to be able to learn from a guy who can take a block of rust and find the firearm inside of it and restore it. That's usually the guy you want to get advice from. But as far as actual books, I, I know a gentleman named Marcus Allen Weldon. Uh, he's uh, from Michigan. Uh, several years back, he was involved in a self-defense situation. Uh, he has a book out that's called The Santa Shooter. Uh, it's, a, it's not a long book. It's not a you know, thoroughly heavy read, but it is chock full of information that any gun owner that finds himself in a situation where they may be confronted with having used deadly physical force, it's pretty much the worst case scenario of what the legal system will do to you. 
Uh, it's called the Santa Shooter. Uh, if you look up his website, as a matter of fact, I pulled it up over here earlier, and now I can't find it. It's MarcusAllenWeldon.com. It's uh, Marcus, common spelling, Weldon, W-E-L-D-O-N, Allen, A-L-L-E-N.com. I highly recommend it. It's, a, you can, it's a, a, a downloadable book. I believe it's on Amazon. You can download it from his website. It's only a couple of bucks. But if you want to know what kind of hell and torture that you can go through for doing the thing you need to do to, to preserve your own life. Marcus went through it. And uh, some of what he went through is something that uh, any of us that lives in a state that's not necessarily Second Amendment friendly, if we should happen to be in that situation, that's, uh, that's something that we should guarantee to expect. There's a lot of good advice in that book, and I would, I would re highly recommend that to everybody. Thank you. And I'm going to put links to L1F.us on the web, uh, on the show notes page. Any other links that I should throw up there? Well, if uh, if you want to find us on Facebook, you can find us at uh, the Liberty First Foundation uh, on Facebook. You can just put that in a little search box and it'll come up. You can actually find us by state by putting L1F and then your state name and then your state chapter will actually come up. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at The Religion of Arms. Uh, it's a private group, so you actually have to uh, click join, and we have to just, we actually screen every member that comes in there, so we ask a couple of pointed questions. No, we don't ask for credit card information or anything. That comes later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can find us on there. We have a little screening process. We, we very heavily moderate the group. To make sure that we don't ever get put in a situation where we have our group's rights be restricted because we know that uh, certain social media individuals are very strict as far as what content they'll allow so you know we have a, a, a set of rules that are out there uh, as far as our website if you want to find us on www.l1f.us uh, if you go to that website, you'll have a link to all of our tremendous articles that are on. We have a team of fantastic writers. Uh, we have a couple of people who you might be familiar with from YouTube, with some of our content creators. Uh, Dan Abraham, they, they, you know him as the firearm guy on YouTube. He writes a lot of articles for us. Tack Cat, he writes for us. Uh, uh, Joel Persinger, the gun guy from out in California, he's been working with us a lot lately to help us promote. Uh, various things that we're doing. I actually have to speak with him over the weekend. We're recording an interview. Uh, and you'll be able to also find all of our YouTube channels. I have my own YouTube channel. Uh, uh, it's called The Range Report, where right now most of what's up there is a lot of our video from SHOT Show, but we'll be doing gun reviews and product reviews and stuff like that. And if it's good, we tell you. If it's bad, we tell you. If it's, uh, you know, worth it or not, you know, we tell you. We don't uh, we don't get paid for our interviews, so you know it's an unbiased account of what we what we're telling you, uh, and that's about it. And every, we we try to be uh, you know up to date with everything. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, but you can find all of those links through the uh, L1F website. Well, Frank, I, I thank you so much for being on the show. Any parting words for our listeners? Uh, parting words, folks. Uh, Get active. If uh, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And there are more than enough of them willing to take these rights away. So for God's sake, please, for the benefit of yourself and your children, get out there and get involved with the Second Amendment community. Do what you can to let your voice be heard. Uh, because if uh, you're not screaming, somebody will be screaming in your place except holding up the opposite sign. So that's the best I can tell you. Well, I thank you so much for being on the show. And I look forward to talking to you again, too. James, thank you, and uh, we look forward to having you on our show sometime this week, too. That'd be great. Great. Thanks. Good night, everybody. God bless. Thanks again for tuning in to episode 118 of the Out of Order Gun Rights Podcast. Show notes page for today's episode is outoforderjamescalita.com forward slash 118. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. All right. So that was uh, James Johnson. Frank Johnson from the First Liberty First Foundation. I thought that was a pretty cool idea about having that range day. So I got to go find that, I guess. But if we say, hey, listen, can you share this very important article? 
And if you're silly as them to get in, but, you know, it's up to us. Strange day. This is going to be to us. And if we can't make that simple sacrifice of sharing articles, making phone calls, attending events, for God's sake, Range Day is going to be a fantastic event. There is absolutely no reason why, unless you're physically incapable of getting to a range, why somebody shouldn't want to go to Range Day. This is going to be a fantastic event. You're going to meet people in your community, people that you probably didn't even realize are going on. Those you're going to find there. You're going to find a lot of friendships, a lot of camaraderie, and you're going to find a lot more support. Maybe that little bit of support is what's going to invigorate the Second Amendment community to the point where we start feeling that passion again. You know, uh, you know this idea of, well, they're not coming for my hunting rifle. Yeah, they are. Right? They're coming yeah. for your hunting rifle. They're, they're coming for your shotgun. They're coming for your black powder gun. Believe me when I tell you, they're coming for it. If we don't stand up now and get involved with... Holy shit, July 6th. I'm not telling you to get involved with my organization. I mean, we're, we're a little blip on the radar. I mean, we're, we're lucky when we get an interview that we're able to you know, share some of what we do. But get involved with some of the groups. Even if you don't like them, God's sake, get your name out there. You know, get on that list so they can bolster one more person on the list. If you don't have a pistol permit... If you're in a state that requires it, even if you don't want to carry a firearm, get your pistol permit. Because your state might not know how many people have what guns, but they know how many people in your state have a pistol permit. And if you have a state like New York, where we only have 600,000 registered pistol permits in the state of New York, imagine how much different our politicians would look at our state if there were three million pistol permit holders, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you might not want the gun, but if you're not ready to defend the Second Amendment, there might be another right. So, all right, well, that's a bunch of time. I uh, appreciate the people that joined us, but it's gotten all crazy out there, so there's no point in wasting time. They don't want to waste any of yours. Uh, create these workshops. We've been live for an hour or something. But uh, I don't have any emails saying anybody's late and looks like everybody's just busy living their lives. So uh, we'll continue to do these. We want to thank our Patreons who make this possible. Give me the time to uh, spend on these kind of projects and we'll continue to keep at it. Thanks everybody for showing up and being here, being part of the conversation. Uh, next week on Tuesday is Every Second Matters. That's been going on for six years now. And... Uh, it's just uh, the concept is to keep the lines of communication open on the second day of each month. Take a moment and think about our Second Amendment. If you create content, of course, you're encouraged to do something that's focused on our second. Um, we'll be doing uh, conversations. I'm sure plenty of the shows that happen on Tuesday will focus a little bit on the Every Second Matters. I'll continue to keep inviting everybody I know who's Second Amendment media to uh, every second matters chats and to events like this we've got an idea for this year i'll try to work on it before next tuesday which isn't very long i guess it's tomorrow and monday but uh we're going to do something like we did with the uh, uh form like we did with the uh chat battle the other night everything we do is to build skills so that we can use it for better stuff in the future more important stuff and uh, if we can use that as a way to get people to uh drop some Every Second Matters information at their convenience, then we'll work on that. So uh, thanks for the people that jumped in who are backers of the project. This is all about the Clash Batch, Clash Patch Batch. So it's a bunch of patches, patches about the Kalashnikov, and we're doing it in a, series, in a set. Let's see, we had one person join just before the show. We'll refresh now. We started off at 888, and we're still at 888 with 26 backers. We just hit 50%. We've got eight days to go. Uh, crowdfunding. You know, I could go find somebody I know who has a bunch of money and say, hey, I want to make patches, and I could go make those patches, and I could sell them at a profit, and that's a business, right? You could do that. As long as you got clever ideas and people want to buy them, that's a business. I don't want to do it that way. I like doing it on this Indiegogo campaign. Uh, for one, it shows, I, I try to do these open in these workshops so that people can see how the Indiegogo camp uh, project works, how the, the system works. But if you go over to Indiegogo and you type in AK-47, for example, and you just get all the results from AK-47, 
sure, you'll get my playing cards there, but you'll get this bullshit about some war first person shooter that raised a hundred dollars headshot zombie experience that raised $45, something about an art terrorist waging war that raised $15,000, a bud locker, so some kind of marijuana thing for some kind of fake money outside the wire. I don't know, it's some sort of maybe military thing. There's our buyer's guide, some kind of comic. I don't know what that deal is. Some kind of need to go fight help ISIS. So some guy's trying to go get funded to help ISIS. Then you uh, get some kind of soup delivery. You get some kind of maybe, a I don't know what that is, a graphic novel that raised six grand. So there's not much out there. So I'm just trying to put stuff out there that has, I don't know, some sort of two-way message. If you type in gun, do what happens on Indiegogo when you type in gun. You get this next generation of gun storage that raised almost $600,000 for a chamber flag that has a lock on it. Uh, you got a uh, fourth annual t-shirt. Oh, this is from CN Arsenal. So there's a project. They raised $60,000 to make t-shirts on this on this platform. They did that. Oh, they're still doing that right now. So that's that's happening right now on this platform. You've got uh, something about a Western, uh, about a young man who visits his father in prison wanting to know the whereabouts of a gun, more than likely. It's $2,000 raised uh, and that was funded. Here's a noon gun. Explores the impact of uh guns right dirty gun guns explosions goats helped us make this short film drop gun a young soldier in afghanistan faces his dilemma when he accidentally shoots a shepherd boy the gun we reached our goal do you think this is a pro gun one uh gun cat the story of a cat an old man and the gun between them uh mama's gun um melbourne 1942 a dark tale of a diabolical mother uh, gun simulator that only raised forty-seven dollars. Some kind of magnet. I don't know what this is, but uh, some sort of stock or something for. I don't know what that is. Then you get something else. So a lot of times I, when I see these, I see these uh, anti-gun things raising a bunch of money. So I just like the idea that we're doing a project that's pro-gun, making some money. So it looks like uh, the CN Arsenal project is doing a documentary series in the Anvil. Do the maintenance by ordering our shirts. Support so support the series and then their work, I guess, by ordering their t-shirts. And they've raised $54,000 from a 1,000 backers for t-shirts. So that's allowing a project. People really like this project. They do uh, the animations and stuff, and they do uh, some sort of posters and uh, putting stuff into real life. Don't they do books or something? So uh, they provide like a, a growing inventory or library archive of all their old guns that they own. And then uh, I guess now they got some t-shirts here. No idea what any of this stuff is. So I guess a bunch of things for their viewers that understand. And there's some power out there. So that's 500, how many? 1,000 backers out there are using this platform. That's another pro-gun uh, project that raised almost 60 grand for their for what they're doing out there so uh that's why we do this so that we can help people to get to work with these platforms think of them less as a confusing challenge and less is and more of a recipe uh, it's definitely possible if you've got a project that's worth a shit and you want to see it happen uh put some work into it we live in a time that's better than anything else before for getting information out there and uh having people work together We'll leave you with this National Range Day concept on uh, July 6th. Uh, we just listened to the dude on the James Cleta show talk about this. And uh, looks like we don't have much time. If you uh, have a range like you've suggested, talk to a couple of ranges in each state. So if you know somebody that has something to do with a range, uh, perhaps there's a little time still to put up something and do some kind of an open house and get new shooters out. Awesome idea. With that, we'll say goodbye with our friend Charles here in Tucson. Guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching GunWebsites.com.